The world they found was one of vast stretches of lush green mountains, fading into infinite blue, the tallest mountain east of the Mississippi River. The slopes and valleys of this seemingly endless mountain range were covered with miles and miles of old growth forests composed of colossal chestnut, oak, and hemlock trees towering above some of the oldest and wildest rivers in the world. Although life was harsh and settlement along the steep mountain slopes a tremendous challenge, these new Appalachian settlers carved out an existence of subsistence farming and singing ballads. For over 70 years, the mountain settlers developed a bucolic life in relative harmony and with little contact with the rest of the developing American society. In East Tennessee, a group of local unionists conspired to burn nine bridges along the East Tennessee and Virginia Railroad in advance of the federal invasion. The saboteurs set out on November 8, 1861, under cover of darkness, and succeeded in destroying five of their targets. The planned invasion by the Union Army, however, was called off and Confederate forces moved quickly to make an example of the Union sympathizers. Traitors in East Tennessee are to be tried summarily by drumhead, court-martial, and if found guilty, executed on the spot by hanging. It would be well to leave their bodies hanging in the vicinity of the burned bridges. Confederate Secretary of War, J.P. Benjamin. The Confederates arrested and imprisoned some of the bridge burners and executed at least five. An unknown number fled and hid in the surrounding mountains. David Fry of Greene County, Tennessee, was among those who took to this destination, which offered ample cover, the isolated mounds of Shelton Laurel, Madison County, North Carolina. On May 13, 1861, Voters gathered here in Marshall, the county seat of Madison County, to elect a delegate to the secession convention, which was going to be held in Raleigh. The citizens were divided in their loyalties. Sheriff Ransom P. Merrill and others were later described as hustling for Jeff Davis and the Confederacy, while men of different opinions were shouting Washington and the Union. One witness later noted that a great deal of liquor had been consumed that day. When a dispute broke out between some of the Unionists and Sheriff Merrill, he drew his gun and shot 
wounding Elijah Tweed. Elijah's father, Neely Tweed, the former clerk of Superior Court in Madison County, then shot Merrill with a double barrel shotgun and killed him. The Tweeds later joined the 4th Tennessee Union Infantry, but Neely died of fever in 1862. The voters from Madison County elected secessionist J.A. McDowell to the state convention. The local war within a war had escalated in the mountains by January 1863 when Unionists from the county's Shelton Oral community were deprived of salt. A band of 50 or 60 Union troops and sympathizers raided Marshall, taking salt and other provisions and wounding Confederate Captain John Peak. The raiders also ransacked the home of Colonel Lawrence M. Allen of the 64th North Carolina Infantry. His home is right behind me. It is said that two of Allen's children were desperately ill, lying in the house, and eventually died. In response to the raid in Marshall, Confederate troops marched on Shelton Laurel to put down the insurrection and recover property taken from Marshall. Meeting resistance, the Confederates summarily executed at least 13 prisoners, men and boys, in what became known as the Shelton Laurel Massacre. January 20th, 1863. General, as I informed you yesterday by telegraph, Captain Nelson has returned and reports that his company went into the Laurel Valley, North Carolina, and had a brush with the Tories in which he killed 13 and captured 20. Colonel Allen's 64th North Carolina Regiment and the men of his command are said to have been hostile to the Laurel men and they to the former for a long time. A kind of feud existed between them. Of the 13 men killed by Nelson's cavalry, all but one or two were deserters from Colonel Allen's regiment. They formed part of an expedition against Marshall and no doubt plundered Allen's house. Brigadier General W.G.M. Davis to General Henry Heth. The incident made national news and even spread internationally after January 1863. The Union Army condemned the incident while the Confederates scrambled to get more information. Blame eventually landed on Lieutenant Colonel James Keith of the 64th North Carolina Infantry Regiment, who was said by some to have been in command of the Laurel operation due to Colonel Lawrence Allen's absence. To this day, facts are elusive and the majority of information about the incident comes from secondary sources and oral tradition. But new light has been shed on the incident due to newly discovered primary source documents. By 1863, the people of Shelton Laurel had had enough. On January 8th, approximately 50 men descended from the valley and stormed Marshall, looting stores and ransacking homes. I think the attack on Marshall was gotten up to obtain salt, for want of which there is great suffering in the mountains. Plunder of other property followed as a matter of course. Brigadier General W.G.M. Davis. News of the raid enraged Confederates. Even Zebulon Vance, sympathetic to his fellow Mountaineers, demanded action to be taken. I hope you will not relax until they are crushed, but do not let our excited people deal too harshly with these misguided men. Zebulon Vance. The 64th North Carolina, allegedly under the command of Lieutenant Colonel James Keith at the time, was sent to Shelton Laurel by General Henry Heth in Knoxville with orders to shoot any resistors. Together with Captain Thomas M. Nelson's Rangers, a partisan cavalry detachment from Georgia, Keith and his cousin Allen split their force and moved on to the valley. January, 1863, Madison County, North Carolina. Snow lay scattered across the ridge lines as Confederate soldiers of the 64th North Carolina Infantry Regiment marched towards the remote Shelton Laurel Valley. Their orders are simple, root out the deserters and unionists using the valley as a base for raids against Confederate holdings. Leading the soldiers are two former local clerks of court, Colonel Lawrence M. Allen and Lieutenant Colonel James A. Keith, both of Madison County. Over several days, the Confederates fight numerous skirmishes with local bushwhackers. 
the soldiers torture and whip the local women, but manage to capture only a handful of old men and boys. Ordered to stand trial as traitors, 13 of the prisoners are marched off towards Knoxville, Tennessee. Several miles down the road, however, the captives are ordered to kneel in a desolate corner of a field. The terrible reality flashed upon the minds of the doomed patriots. Old man Wood, 60 years of age, cried out, For God's sake, man, you're not going to shoot us. Give us at least time to pray. They were informed that Keith was in command and that there was no time for praying. The soldiers raised their guns and the victims shuddered convulsively. The word was given to fire. Memphis Bulletin. As the gun smoke cleared, the prisoners, ranging in age from 13 to 60, lay dead on the half-frozen ground. The event would become known as the Shelton Laurel Massacre, the most infamous symbol of the Civil War in the Southern Highlands. It was a war of the people, by the people, a war of personal vendettas, changeable loyalties and deprivations for all involved. Its terrible legacy would live on in the memories of mountaineers long after the gun fell silent. As news of the Shelton Laurel Massacre trickled out of the mountains, an appalled Governor Vance ordered Augustus Merriman, solicitor of the North Carolina 8th District, to launch an investigation. On February 24th, Merriman reported his findings. Thirteen prisoners, at least, were killed by the order of Lieutenant Colonel J.A. Keith. Most of them were taken at their homes, and none of them made resistance when taken. Several women were severely whipped and ropes were tied around their necks. It is said that Colonel L.A. Mallon was not in command and that Keith commanded. One thing is certain, 13 prisoners were shot without trial or any hearing whatever and in the most cruel manner. Merriman to Vance, February 24th, 1863. News of the atrocity continues to spread across the country. The Memphis Bulletin, a pro-union newspaper, published a sensationalized description of the massacre on July 9th. Two weeks later, the article ran in the New York Times. Across the North, the Shelton Laurel Massacre became a rallying cry for the Northern war effort. Post-war accounts of the massacre have continued to implicate Keith as a culprit behind the murders, citing Merriman's report and apocryphal, unnamed eyewitness accounts. But recent scholarship has raised several questions around the commonly accepted story. Merriman admits to his difficulties obtaining information several times in his reports to Vance, yet goes on to relate very specific details of the execution, particularly Keith's guilt. As attorneys practicing law in Marshall before the war, both Merriman and Vance were familiar with court clerk James Keith. In fact, Merriman had litigated against Keith several years prior, seeking money owed to his clients. Confederate military records indicate Allen was present and in command of the 64th North Carolina at the time of the event, contradicting Merriman's claims. Further complicating the story is the presence of Nelson's Georgia Partisans. A report from General Henry Heth to Confederate officials on January 21, 1863, credits Nelson's cavalrymen with killing 13 and capturing 20 during the Shelton Laurel campaign. Claims that Keith became a fugitive after the massacre have also been debunked. Primary documents reveal that Keith commanded troops until the end of the war, engaging in several skirmishes. African Americans living in the Southern Appalachians found themselves at a crossroads during the war. Some, like Buncombe County's Sarah Gudger, remained on their former master's properties, fearing retribution if they fled. Others, like Madison County freeman John Burnett, joined with northern forces to fight for his people's freedom. Haywood County freeman James Casey was ironically ordered into Confederate ranks under the Conscription Act as a free citizen of North Carolina.
Conditions in the Southern Highlands continued to deteriorate as Confederate fortunes waned. This affected mountaineers deserted in droves, alarmed by reports of desperate conditions at home. Dear husband, I seek myself to drop you a few lines to let you know that me and Sally is well as common. I got the first letter yesterday that I received from you since you left. I got five from you yesterday. They all come together. This is the first one I have wrote, for I didn't know where to write you. You said you hadn't anything to eat. I wish you was here to get some beans for dinner. The people is all turning to Union here since the Yankees has got Vicksburg. I want you to come home as soon as you can after you get this letter. I want you to come home the worst that I ever did. The conscripts is all at home yet, and I don't know what they will do with them. The folks is living here and going north as fast as they can. So I will close. Your wife till death, Martha Revis. In April 1864, a group of hungry women in Burnsville raided Confederate bread supplies stored there. Across the region, the mountain passes and roads swarmed with outlaws and deserters. The Confederate authorities called them bushwhackers and despised them worse than the Yankees. Perhaps the most inexcusable practice in all the Civil War was that of bushwhacking. The bushwhacker was not a soldier, but a cowardly, contemptible battleman who would lie in ambush to kill some unguarded traveler simply for the plunder he would obtain. Washington Davis. With Confederate forces crumbling, Union partisans like Colonel George Kirk began raids into West North Carolina, striking indiscriminately at anything in their way. The county has gone up. It has got to be impossible to get any man out there unless he is dragged out. I have 100 men at this place to guard against Kirk of Laurel and cannot reduce the force. General McElroy, Home Guard Commander, Mars Hill. On October 16, 1863, the 2nd North Carolina Mounted Infantry, a Union regiment, engaged with local Confederate forces at the isolated hamlet of Warm Springs. The rebels made a fresh attack on Warm Springs this morning at daylight and were repulsed after a skirmish of two hours, killing one and wounding five on our side. Brigadier General Orlando B. Wilcox, U.S. Army. Several days of confused fighting ensued, with both sides suffering unnecessary casualties. The enemy, being informed of our movements down the creek, made such preparations that enabled them successfully to meet our force coming down the creek, numbering a little more than 100 men and killed and captured nearly all of them. R.W. Pulliam, Confederate States of America. During the Battle of Warm Springs, Confederate Major John W. Woodfin of Asheville, a former lawyer, was killed during a skirmish while leading a detachment from his battalion against the advancing Federals. Two of the more notable students who studied under John W. Woodfin were Augustus Merriman, North Carolina solicitor, and Zebulon Baird Vance, the governor of North Carolina. By November 1st, the Union force had retreated to East Tennessee. Dissension in the Southern Appalachians intensified with the passage of the Conscription Act in 1862. With the cry of rich man's war, poor man's fight, many mountaineers deserted the first chance they had and went home. I call your earnest attention to the importance of suspending the conscription law in the mountain counties. They are filled with Tories and deserters, burning, robbing, and murdering. They have been robbed and eaten out their condition will be altogether wretched, and hunters will go to the enemy for protection and bread. Zebulon Vance to Secretary of War Seddon, April 11, 1864. With the men gone, the women of the region were left to run the farm and household with little help or resources. At least one woman, Sarah Melinda Pritchard Blaylock, disguised herself as a man and enlisted with her husband. 
For those on the home front, supplies were scarce. Inflation was high, and homesteads were under constant threat from outlaws and foragers. Salt, essential to survive in the winter, was hoarded in stockpiles and denied to suspected unionists. As William Sherman stormed up the Atlantic coast and Ulysses Grant tightened his grip on Robert E. Lee's army in northern Virginia, the scant Confederate forces remained in the mountains convened near Asheville under General James Martin. On April 3, 1865, a Union force under Colonel Isaac Kirby marched on Asheville from Tennessee. With only two cannons at their disposal, Martin's Confederates, under the command of Colonel George Clayton, managed to drive Kirby's force away from the town on April 6th without a single soldier lost on either side. Kirby's force had roughly a thousand men and outnumbered Clayton's Confederates three to one. The Confederate victory was short-lived, however. Lee's army surrendered at Appomattox on April 9th as Sherman's army approached from the Carolina coast and Union raiders poured over the mountains. General Martin retreated to White Sulphur Springs, known today as the town of Waynesville. With Martin was William Holland Thomas's legion of Cherokee warriors from the Eastern Band, widely feared among Union troops. Thomas's legion engaged and surrounded pursuing Federal soldiers on May 6th, killing one Union man, quite possibly the last soldier killed in the war east of the Mississippi. The next morning, General Martin, along with Thomas and several Cherokee warriors, went to demand the Federal surrender. The Union commander informed them the war was over and requested Martin surrender instead. I have the honor to report that General Martin, Colonel Thomas, and Lieutenant Colonel Love surrendered to Lieutenant Colonel Bartlett their forces with the Department of West North Carolina, Colonel C.G. Holly. William Holland Thomas's Confederate Legion was the last Confederate unit to disband east of the Mississippi River. The Civil War had come to an end. Between 1861 and 1865, the residents of Buncombe, Madison, and Yancey counties, as well as East Tennessee's Green, Cock, and Washington counties, experienced the harsh realities and brutal conditions fueled by the Civil War. Members of both the Union and Confederate armies were occasionally known to whip and rape residents in efforts to gain information about the enemy. They employed an agonizing form of torture also to obtain intelligence where they would hang people, not until they were dead, but in a way such that the victims would be allowed to breathe intermittently. Between local regiments of the Confederacy, the 64th North Carolina Regiment, the Home Guard Militia, and Kirk's Union Regiments, 2nd and 3rd North Carolina Mounted Infantry, every citizen was directly affected by the war, and many were tortured for their cooperation with either the Union or Confederates. These soldiers knew who was Union, who was rebel, and who was hiding out from the war. If they didn't, the Home Guard made it their business to find out. Neighbors informed on neighbors, brothers, fathers, uncles, and cousins served on different sides. A. Christine Tipton, Civil War in the Mountains. Today, Buckner Gap is a scenic location along Interstate 26, with a stunning peak that rises 3,300 feet and overlooks Mars Hill, North Carolina. It was named for its 19th century owner, Alan Buckner. The war divided families in a most painful way, and this is vividly illustrated by the story of the Buckner brothers. Alan and brother Levi both answered the call to war for the Confederacy after the Confederate government passed the Conscription Act in 1862. Alan served in Company A of the 64th North Carolina Infantry Regiment, while Levi enlisted in Company E. The pair fought on some of the most rugged terrain in the eastern United States for a seemingly endless three years. Roughly five weeks before General Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox, a large group of soldiers in the mountains changed their allegiances. On March 1, 1865, a battalion of Confederate soldiers deserted and joined the Union Army near Burnsville in Yancey County, North Carolina. Levi Buckner was one of the 29 men from the 64th North Carolina Confederate Infantry to join Kirk's Raiders 
3rd North Carolina Mounted Union Infantry. For the remainder of the war, Levi served in a blue uniform, while Allen finished out in a gray uniform, embodying the brother versus brother reality. No one could know how their divided loyalties affected their relationship, but a photograph exists that shows the two together at Allen's 100th birthday gathering on Buckner Gap in 1927. Both lived to be 102. Farm families here in Mars Hill established the French Broad Institute in 1856, soon after they changed the name to Mars Hill College. This four-acre college campus had three structures, a two-story brick classroom building and two framed buildings, one a dormitory and one a teacher's residence. During the war, neighbors, families, even brothers here were divided in their loyalties to the Southern cause, but many joined the Confederate Army, at least for the first two years of the war. Mars Hill was a strategic location, a crossroads for north-south and east-west travel. A 100-man detachment from the 64th North Carolina Infantry, called Keith's Detail, was posted here, the first of several Confederate units at Mars Hill during the war. The college was closed during the last two years of the conflict as conditions in mountain communities deteriorated and support for the Confederacy waned. Home Guard Commander Brigadier General John W. McElroy had his headquarters here after July 1863. He wrote to North Carolina Governor Zebulon B. Vance in April 1864, I have 100 men at this place to guard against Union Colonel George W. Kirk of Laurel and cannot reduce the force. In fact, it seems to me that there is a determination of the people in this country generally to do no more service in the cause. Confederate troops left Mars Hill in search of food in March of 1865 just before Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox. Kirk led his 3rd North Carolina Union Mounted Infantry into the village and burned the college dormitory and teacher's residence, constituting 40% of the campus at the time. Mars Hill College survived the war's depredations, but it took 40 years to replace what had been destroyed. Today, 162 years after the war, Mars Hill continues to thrive. In 2013, the institution became a university. The massacre at Shelton Laurel in the Madison County, North Carolina mountains sparked local outrage, captured national headlines, tarnished the names of the local Confederates, and earned the county the detestable nickname, Bloody Madison. Yet, more than 150 years later, debate persists as to what actually happened. And that long ago strife is still leaving its imprint on the people in the local communities. In some ways, Shelton Laurel hasn't changed much. Small farms still dot the starkly beautiful valley. Locals are friendly and courteous, provided you respect their privacy. The Shelton clan and related families have lived in the area since the late 1700s and many current residents can trace their family lines back to one of the 13 victims that were executed. To these descendants, the massacre remains a central aspect of their family history. When North Carolina seceded from the Union in 1861, some Shelton Laurel residents fled north to join the Union Army. Others tried to remain neutral, hoping their isolation would keep them safe. But when the Confederate Conscription Act passed in April 1862, the people of Shelton Laurel balked. Many who were forced to enlist quickly deserted. Others actively harbored Union agents and raided local Confederate households and stockpiles. After the raid marshal, the Confederates were forced to act. Governor Zebulon Vance demanded a response and Confederate General Henry Heth gave direct orders to kill all resistors. Colonels Allen and Keith of the 64th North Carolina, Captain Nelson's Georgia Cavalry Unit, and several other local Confederate units, including the Thomas Legion, and local home guards were sent into the valley to put down the insurrection. On December 18, 1862, just one month before the shootings in Shell Narl, the Asheville News published a message from Colonel Lawrence M. Allen mustering all men of the 64th North Carolina Regiment. This message from Allen seemed to be a buildup for an attack. In this particular case, the attack was to be on Shell Narl. Attention, Headquarters, 64th Regiment, North Carolina Volunteers, 
Knoxville, Tennessee, November 27, 1862. All men absent from this command on furlough are ordered to report at these headquarters immediately. Men on sick list must report also at the expiration of their furlough or they will be published as deserters and rewards offered for them. A surgeon certificate will not be taken unless he makes a full statement and is convinced that it would endanger their lives to remove to camp and he must make the statement upon oath by command of Colonel L. M. Allen, commanding 64th Regiment, North Carolina Volunteers. On January 26, 1863, just a few days after the prisoners' executions, the Daily State Journal in Raleigh published a very detailed piece. It described a current assault on Shelton Laurel to flush out the deserters and Tories blamed for the Marshall Raid and other local raids. Daily State Journal, Raleigh, North Carolina, January 26, 1863. The Troubles in Madison. The militia of this county, says the Asheville News of the 22nd, two regiments under Colonels Young and Jarrett left last week for Madison County. A cavalry company under Major John W. Woodson left on Saturday. Colonel Lawrence Allen, we learn, has been in the disaffected region for several days with the force of about 1,000 men from Tennessee. He had encountered the Tories killing 20 and capturing about 30. The militia of Madison and Yancey were also on hand, and the authorities are determined to make clean work of it. Their recent outrages called for severe punishment. A large body of them visited the town of Marshall and helped themselves to every species of property that suited their fancy, severely wounding Captain Peak, who resisted them. While at Marshall, they manifested their dislike of Colonel Allen by destroying his furniture, carrying off all the clothing of his family, and rudely treating his wife and children. That was a bad policy in them, though, for they had better rouse the den of lions than to thus obtrude themselves into the sacred domestic circle of Lawrence Allen. He is not made of the sort of stuff that allows such outrages to go unpunished, and it was eminently proper that he should lead the forces against them. We have the assurance of the authorities that they intend to finish the job this time. Further details are ambiguous, and who is truly to blame for the executions may never be known. On January 1st, 1863, roughly three weeks prior to the executions on Laurel, Brigadier General W.G.M. Davis proposed to North Carolina Governor Zebulon Vance that the citizens of Shelton Laurel be taken out of the valley and aided into Kentucky. This was after several attempts by the Confederate government to rid the Madison County and East Tennessee mountains of all deserters and Tories. General W.G.M. Davis wrote to Governor Zebulon Vance on January 1st, 1863. His Excellency, Zebulon B. Vance, I have directed all citizen prisoners to be turned over to the civil authorities of Madison. They are all implicated in the burning of the town of Marshall. I have placed Major W.N. Garrett, 64th North Carolina Volunteers, in charge of a force of about 200 of his regiment, one company of cavalry, and 30 Indians which force is now on Laurel Creek. Major Garrett has orders to pursue and arrest every man in the mountains of known bad character, whether engaged in any of the late outrages or not. He will be aided by six companies of cavalry scouring the mountain regions. Colonel William Holland Thomas with 200 whites and Indians of his legion is operating in Madison with orders to arrest all deserters and recusant conscripts and all Tories who have been engaged in unlawful practices on the Tennessee line of the mountains. He will be aided by cavalry and infantry. Believing that it will be of service to your state to get rid of such a population as that inhabiting the Laurel region, I have proposed to allow all who are not implicated in any crime to leave the state and to aid them in crossing into Kentucky. I am informed that nearly the whole population are desirous of accepting this offer they will be driven to do so from necessity, as I learn our troops have consumed all the corn and meat in the settlement. If the people alluded to agree to immigrate, I will cause them to be paid for their property used by our troops. I propose to give all the Tories of bad character who may be arrested the option of going to prison unless they find security for good behavior or of enlisting in the Confederate Army. If they enlist, they will be sent to Mississippi from whence they will not find it so easy to desert. Brigadier General W.G.M. Davis to Zebulon Vance. 
North Carolina Governor Vance issued a response four weeks later, February 2nd, 1863. General W.G.M. Davis, in regard to running them into Kentucky, I approve of the plan, provided they desire to go. I would not wish, however, to exile the women and children or old men if they desire to remain, as the law ought to be strong enough to keep them in subjection. North Carolina Governor Zebulon Vance. This action, of course, never happened due to the massacre and the investigation that followed. Today, most outsiders don't even know where the old Shelton family cemetery is. There are no elaborate headstones. A granite plaque placed by the Shelton family in 1963 bears the names of those killed in the massacre. But for the most part, it's left to the scattered stones stuck in the ground beneath the trees to indicate that the unnamed dead rest below. Looking down over the Shelton Laurel Valley, the actual site that the murders took place is disputed by some of the Shelton family members still living in the valley. Nevertheless, the trials and tribulations of the Civil War will forever haunt the local communities. The war may have been over, but the wounds inflicted upon the people of the Southern Highlands would take many years to heal. Soldier, free blacks, and bushwhackers settled into a fragile truce, frequently broken by spats of violence and revenge killings. Several widows from Shelton Laurel would spend the better part of a decade lobbying the federal government unsuccessfully for pensions for their husband's service of the Union cause. In 1866, Lawrence Allen, James Keith, and several others were indicted for their roles in the Shelton Laurel Massacre. Allen fled west to avoid capture while Keith spent the next three years behind bars. While awaiting trial, Keith acknowledged his role in the torture of the women, but asserted he was innocent of the prisoners' murders. January 31st, 1868. I have not had a copy of the charges, but I am informed it is those charges which are being brought against me about those men that Captain Brown executed on Laurel. I know the commanding general ordered the men to be shot, and I can prove that. I can produce orders showing Allen commanding, and if I knew where Captain Brown was, could prove direct orders. James A. Keith. Keith would escape from the Buncombe County Jail in 1869 and join his cousin in Arkansas, where both men died and are buried. Was James Keith a cold-blooded murderer or a scapegoat for the terrors that engulfed the Blue Ridge during the Civil War? With few primary sources available, we rely on oral tradition, contradictory military records, and secondhand accounts to inform us. The secret ultimately may lie buried along the ridge lines beneath the silent unmarked headstones of those who fell, or echoing in the valleys, hollows, and memories of their descendants living today among the Southern Highlands.